Our reading this morning is in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 10. Matthew and chapter 10. We'll commence to read at verse 1. Verse 1, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these, the first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James the son of Alphanus, and Labias, whose name was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Provide neither gold, nor silver, nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. And when ye come into an house, salute it, and if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it, But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves, be ye therefore wise as serpents, and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. For when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth unto the end, to the end, shall be saved. We'll end there at verse 22. May God bless his word this morning to our hearts and may we hear God's voice and it's always a challenge whenever you read about these disciples who were being sent forth at the master's command and what they were told to do and not to do and they were told that they were to take neither script nor money nor two coats, neither shoes nor staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. I was speaking on my holidays to someone that is a good Christian lady in our church, and I'm sure a great benefit to our fellowship that she's her and her husband's in. But she was saying to me, she said, do you know something in our church is quite a big church, but nobody wants to entertain now. There's all the microwaves, there's the cookers, there's so much, and it seems to be that whenever there's visiting speakers and so on, there's not so many that wants to open up their home. I thank God for those that do and, uh, and so on, and that's not my topic today, by the way, but I'm just pointing out as to how we have read the Word of God and how these disciples were clinging very, very loosely to the things of this world. My text this morning is found in verse 7, and it's just a few words 
and as ye go, preach. Here are these disciples, and they're being sent out as sheep amongst wolves, and their responsibility was to present the gospel to others. Do you may remember that the disciples on one occasion were told to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. But we read here that these 12, they were to, uh, to go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans. They were not to enter. And so they have a very clear view as to where the gospel is to be preached and what was to be said and what was to be done and how that if someone would not respond to the gospel then they were to shake off the dust of their shoes as it were or of their feet or their sandals and the word was very clear and is spoken by the Lord Jesus whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words when ye depart out of that house or city shake off the dust of your feet Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Olive and I was in a train recently in Northern Ireland here. And as we were waiting for the train, I said to Olive, I said, would you look at those two transvestites? Noel says to me, well, how do you know? Well, I said, look, I'm not stupid. And one standing with a mini skirt on, and the other one, he's wearing shorts, and he's showing his belly. And there they get on the train, so unconcerned. Doesn't matter who all is knocking about. And they sit almost just opposite us. These two fellows, they've been very clear, they've had a good shave, but they've the very dark uh, markings of their beard. And the two of them sit there. I never heard tell of the word transvestite until some years back. And I said to all of them, whenever they got off the, the train, I said to her, I said, do you know, if I was to say to those fellows, Catch yourselves on. You stand out a mile. I guarantee you it would be all over social media and I would be classed as homophobic today. And yet I realise, dear friends, today, and I have to be sensitive to this, there are many of God's people today and sadly their children have gone down that route. And as I read the word of God and I read about Sodom and Gomorrah, I read as to how Abraham, he interceded and he prayed for Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know that our own town now celebrates, every town seems to be celebrating all this mixed culture. And there are those, and sadly even, uh, that have been brought up in Christian homes and they have it all splashed about how much that they agree and stand with that type of society. But one day God will judge. But the comparison here is, here are these disciples and they're going and they're presenting the gospel and there are those who do not want it and so they're told, shake off the dust of your feet, it'll be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. I wonder what will be more tolerable in the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than for Cookstown or Ballymena or Belfast or even now in Oma as we see that uh, everything's right across our province today. Will it be more tolerable? Yet I realise, dear friend, that we're living in a day when even bringing up a family is very, very difficult There's so much that has been thrown to them. But that's not my sermon either. My sermon is, as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's a little uh, children's chorus, and it's about preaching the gospel in shoes. 
I've never actually heard it sung, but it goes like this. Do you know, O Christian, you're a sermon in shoes? Do you know, O Christian, you're a sermon in shoes? Jesus calls upon you to spread the good news. And the big chorus goes on and it says this here. So walk it and talk it a sermon in shoes. Live it and give it a sermon in shoes. Teach it and preach it a sermon in shoes. Know it and show it a sermon in shoes. So today, primarily, I want to, us to look at this sermon in shoes as, to, as, as we go, preach. And over this last week again, wherever we have been, whatever we have done, we've been preaching the gospel in one sense or another, wherever we've been. This little children's course reminds us that whenever a, a Christian walks, he or she is expected to share the gospel with others. A couple of weeks ago, I walked to a little place called Babacon. And I was sitting out on a workbench, or not a workbench, a, a, a bench in the park. I was looking up at the sky, and this man walks by with a dog. And then he comes back and he starts to talk to me at Babacon. And he mentions to me that he's saved. <laughs> you travel a long bit in England, mind you, till you get people that are so open sometimes. I, and I, he told me how he got saved and all. And then he says to me, are you a believer? I said, yes, I am. But he said, you know, as I walked by there, he, he says, <laughs> it was him said it, not me. He looked very calm. Well, I said, to be honest with you, I'm sitting here and I'm looking up at the sky and I'm thinking of good people that we know that has passed on and some of them has had a good long life and I'm thinking to myself, what a tragedy if they're lost in a long eternity after living maybe a good operator's life but yet not saved. And we talked on and I, uh, he did say to me, he said, I, as we, we walked down a bit and, and talked, he said, you know, I, use the, I only use the King James Version. So I said, well, really? Because <laughs> again, that's not the norm in England. And he said, yeah, that's all I use. So they told me the reasons why he only used that. And I, they told me that he preaches a bit. But you know, I left that gentleman and thought to myself, isn't it wonderful that no matter where you go, God has his own people. He has his own people. Many years ago, back in the year 1987, whenever our children were very, very small, and they're playing at a beach down in Newquay in Cornwall, and there's this other family beside us, and everybody in the beach is really dressed the same. I remember saying to all of, do you know this, aren't those like Christians there? And the children started mixing with each other, and we got into conversation, and they were. It reminds me that God is his people. But you know, dear friend, it's not always as we preach with our words that will uh, display most results. As you go preach, D.L. Moody said this here, he said, the preaching that this world needs most is the sermons and shoes that are walking with Jesus Christ. Paul, whenever he's writing to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 6 and 15, he says, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. As you go preach. I wonder, and I preach as much to myself as anyone else today, about our preaching over this last week. By where we've been. By what we do. By all the rest of it. And no doubt for each one of you, I... You probably are like myself. You're not familiar maybe with hearing a sermon about a sermon in shoes, but you've heard many preachers preach, of course, in shoes. And it may seem rather strange here, but Jesus was saying to these disciples, as ye go, preach. We're always preaching some kind of a sermon. The sermon that we preach in shoes are far more effective than the sermons that we preach in any pulpit. 
the sermon and shoes will be far, far more effective. As the poet said, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. The greatest sermons in all this world here are the sermons and shoes. And so uh, Christ was commanding these apostles, as you go, preach the word of God. Now, primarily, I'll say this here. I believe that he was saying to his disciples, use your lips to preach the word. There's a time to speak and there's a time to be silent and there's a time to shake off the dust of the feet, he's saying to the disciples. Originally, he's saying to the disciples, preach the word. Like what Paul said to Timothy, to preach the word and be in season and out of season. And so I'll say this here this morning. It's important for us to preach the word of God with our lips. Now, I'm not saying that you should run to everyone in your family and in your community and try to force the gospel upon them. No, I, I believe that'll do more harm than good. But remember, as Paul wrote to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 10, about confessing with our mouth uh, the Lord Jesus. As we go through life's journey, let us tell the good news that our Saviour came to seeking to save the lost. You know, I can honestly say that that gentleman, his name was Alex, that I met in Babacon, it was absolutely lovely to sit there and then to talk and to walk, talking about the things of God and the things that really matter. I asked him, I said to him, I normally don't ask people this, by the way, but I said, what kind of church do you worship in? Well, he said, to be honest with you, you'd hardly even call it a church. <laughs> he said, there's three of us. So three of us. And he says, if you wanted really to push me, I said, I'm not pushing you, Alex, but he said, I suppose maybe you would class her uh, maybe as brethren, but there's three of us. And we meet and we discuss the word of God and so on. How should we preach with our lips? We ought to preach the word of God earnestly. It was so easy to, to preach the word of God with hardness. No, we ought to preach it earnestly. We ought to preach the word of God in love. We ought to be concerned for the men and women that are heading to a lost eternity if they know not Jesus Christ as their Savior. We ought to preach it faithfully. And whether it's teaching in the Bible school or whether it's in the Sunday school or whatever, a faithful witness delivers souls. Now, if I'm going to teach boys or girls that's five or six, there's not point, much point in me teaching them the meat of something that is available for someone maybe in their teens or whatever. No, it has to be, of course, suitable. As you go preach. Whenever Henry Ward Beecher was a young man in the ministry, and sometimes I look back and I realize those days are all gone and, and I, so on. But remember, he was a young man in the ministry. There was a, he was faced with a demand by one of the very prominent members of his congregation. And this very prominent member of his congregation said to him, look here, you've got to soften down your preaching against the slavery question. Henry Ward Beecher is a young man, he said, well, he said, because this senior man said, if you do not soften down your preaching on the slavery question, there are six prominent families that are going to leave the congregation. Henry Ward Beecher responded. Do you know what he said? Give me their names now. He rightly judged that such families who tried to hog tie the true testimony of the preacher were better out of the church than in the church. Now, that's a young man that was preaching many, many years ago. And Jesus is saying to these disciples, beware of men, they'll deliver you up to the councils, they'll scourge you, they'll say all sorts of things about you and so on. But you ought to rejoice in the Lord. I had someone said to me recently that uh, um, there were 
very, very hurt because a neighbor over the fence, a neighbor that had never been in their home, a neighbor over the fence said to them, you know, another of my neighbors has told me, you're a bad person. Whew, that's something to say. And you know, this person said to me, I was so hurt, I just feel like moving away from the area that, that they're in and, and so on. I said, why, why should you? But on reflection, uh, they decided that the next time they get the opportunity to talk to the neighbor, they're going to say to the neighbor, now you tell me, who was it that said I was a bad person? Because I want you to come and bring that person to me. Well, I said, that's exactly, you've done the right thing. You've done the right thing. Somebody comes sometimes spreading gossip and rumors and all the rest of it. You're far better to say, well, look here, come and we'll gather this other person together and see actually what was said. And so Jesus is saying here, beware of men. He says, you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles, and they'll deliver you up and so on. Preaching the gospel with our words. Preaching the gospel as we go preach by our walk. Did you ever hear the old saying? I'm sure you did. Actions speak louder than words. Now the Bible speaks about many different kinds of walks, about walking in darkness, walking in light. Sometimes it speaks of walking after the flesh, walking after the spirit, walking with God, and so are walking in one way or another, we're preaching Christ either in a positive or in a negative way. I read about some of the tests of a sanctified character. It's quite a challenge. I just said this here, can you labor on cheerfully without earthly reward? So easy to say, what's in something for me? The second one was, can you toil on, hopefully, without tangible returns? The third one was, can you travel the road of frequent criticism without bitterness? That's a test of a sanctified character. Can you lift uh, and agonize and sacrifice and pray and give way down out of sight while others lead the possession and receive the honors? Can you do that? Can I do that? Preaching as we walk. We're told in the word of God that Enoch walked with God. You remember the story of the Shunammite woman? She perceived that Elisha was a man of God. It wasn't anything that Elijah said. Elisha said. This man is walking to, backwards and forwards by her window and he's saying nothing at this stage and this woman's looking out and she sees this man walking up and down and passing her house continually and she perceives, do you know this, there's a man of God. And it wasn't what he said. It was his walk. I got a great encouragement whenever I went to Stanton Lee's a couple of Sundays ago because as you notice from the picture that uh, you, you step out of the, the, from the road, as it were, into the wee church, but there's a young lad standing at the doorway. A young fellow, dark hair, a beard. And I happened to say to him, are you Tom? <laughs> he said, yes. I, I don't know you. I said, no, you wouldn't know me at all. And I didn't start to pressurize him or ask him any questions at that stage because we were going into church. But I thought, isn't that lovely to see Tom and a young lad with him in church? And in Stanton Lee's, it's always a wee bit strange because you have your dinner before you go to church. And some old preachers used to say in the past that a Sunday evening service, you were full of beef and unbelief. But their, their service is at 2.30 and their evening service is at 6.30, so both of them are fairly close by. But after the evening service, there's a cup of tea, and so I'm talking to Tom's mother and father, Malcolm and Wilma. 
And Tom is a grandson of the late pastor, Peter Holland, who was the pastor of that church for 27 years or so. And Peter and his wife Vivian used to pray, and they would say, Look, God, will you remember young Tom? Young Tom became very wayward. And then the parents told me, they said, Tom has got saved. Well, I said, would you believe me? I was actually praying for Tom this week that he'd get saved. I've been praying this long time that he'd get saved, but Tom was saved a year and a half ago. <laughs> and they told me how it came about. They said that during COVID, Tom got this great desire to read the Word of God. He's only probably a lad in his late 20s or that now, or 30. And he goes into his workshop and he opens up the book of Revelation and he read all through it. And he didn't seem to get anything out of it. And so he read through it all again and then the second time all he could see was judgment, judgment, judgment. If I die as I am. And young Tom, there in the workshop, asked God to save him. The devil right away said to him, look here Tom, your wife will leave you. Because she hasn't been brought up in that background. And young Tom said nothing for a couple of months. And one day his wife says to him, Tom, I want to ask you something. What is wrong with you? And he says, nothing. She says, I'm telling you now, there's something's wrong with you. There's something going on here. And so Tom says, well, I'm going to tell you now, I got saved a couple of months ago. Do you know what his wife said? I want what you've got. And she sought the Lord too. And it was lovely in that wee church where you have about 30 people. It's lovely to see that young couple in the house of God with their two lads now. Lovely to see it. You know, dear friends, I used to hear the parents, the grandparents, plead with God in the prayer meeting for young Tom. I would say they've lived the life. They've encouraged their children, of course, most of all to, to walk with God. The other boy, Philip, who goes to the church too, uh, Philip is already saved. But preaching with their lips. Using their words, preaching with their walk. I'll close with this here, preaching by our acts. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. One time a man said of a Christian, he makes so much noise with his actions that I cannot hear what he says. He makes so much noise with his actions, I cannot hear what he says. What kind of sermons have we preached this week? I'll conclude, dear friends, with a little poem, and it just says, you tell yourself. You tell yourself. It goes on like this here. You tell on yourself by the friends you seek. Isn't that true? You'd rather have ungodly friends than the people of God. Well, there's something wrong. The poet goes on by the very manner in which you speak. And I know that some of this may seem old-fashioned to this present generation by the way you employ your leisure time by the very use of the dollar and dime. You tell what you are by the things you wear, by the spirit in which your burdens bear, by the kind of things at which you laugh, by the record you play in the phonograph. You tell what you are by the way you walk, by the things of which you delight to talk. Isn't that so true? That's how we tell who we are by the manner in which you bear defeat, by so simple a thing as how you eat, by the books you choose and the well-filled shelf. In these ways and more, you tell in yourself. Preaching the word. Preaching in love. We're writing a gospel, a chapter each day, by the deeds that you do, by the words that you say, men read what you write, whether faithless or true. Say, what is the gospel according to you? What is the gospel? As you go, 
preach. Let's sing our closing hymn. O thou who camest from above, the pure celestial fire to impart, and we'll stand to sing. thank you for your word thank you that whenever you save us that we become your followers you tell us to be an example of the believers in word and in deed and I pray that as we go wherever that might be even today whether it's lifting a phone whether it's sending an email or whatever Lord I pray that we might be conscious that we are preaching the gospel and what is the gospel according to us? Lord, help us to be true and to be faithful to you. Thank you for your love towards us and for all your mercies. We're not worthy of the least of them. And I pray for the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit to be with us this day and until Jesus comes or calls. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>